fighting. We're having a little bit of a lag issue here, actually. So I'm hoping this just sort of resolves itself. We haven't had many connection issues on the Korean server for a long time, but this is pretty terrible at the moment. Parting bottom right, Gumiho top left. I'm hoping this is just going to like calm down in the next couple of minutes. If it doesn't calm down, I will get up one of the other streams and just broadcast from the other stream for this game or so. Um, so yeah, um, basically just give us give us a few moments and hopefully, like you, like you can see, it's already kind of settling down a little bit. So it looks as though I'm just keeping an eye on my ping as well, which is why we've got this open on the top. Parton is going to open with a proxied gateway here for Pixel 1. Parting Pixel 1, actually, uh, his new team, obviously, uh, for last season's China Team Championship, did actually uh, play for Storm Gaming, of course, for a while. You're going to be seeing the refineries dropping down in the main base again. Those up and running, Probe and SCV, going to go fighting against each other as we do have... I mean, at the moment, Gumiho just completely blind to what's going on. Has no idea that this gateway is down at the front. So, Gumiho playing blind is part and going to march on forwards with the Zealot. And we're pressing forwards already. The uh, Marine taking a little bit of damage. CP is going to go down. I mean, obviously, again, you just don't scout this early on. It is a bit problematic for you. It was Marine first instead of a Reaper too. So, that's also kind of a problem, right? Usually, a Reaper would be able to get damage off on the Zealot. Marines can, you know, only do so much. He's going to do this little runaround technique. One Marine chases, one Marine fires. But now a second Zealot shows up and actually might be able to get this SCV on the bunker again. Stalker now on the way up as well. Behind this, Parting does just expand. So, a single proxy gate into an expansion. He's going to pull the Zealot out of there and keep that alive. Guys, this lag is terrible. Like, really, really bad. So, I am going to try and open Crank Stream. This is just really bad. They're just freezing all over. I'm going to try and open Crank Stream. Now, there's obviously going to be like a two minute delay on Crank Stream. But it's open at least so we can jump to it if it continues. I'll give it like another minute. Because, like I say, it's not really been like this for a long time. And it does seem to be smoothing out a little bit. So, I'll give it another minute or so. And if not, we'll jump over to Crank's Vision. So yeah, a couple of Stalkers here poking away from part and able to deal some decent damage at the front on the bunker, but of course, it really is just poking damage, right? The bunker coming up is a huge part of the defense here from Gumiho. Parton now going to go into Blink, and that does give him a few options. Obviously, a Blink up into the main base could be extremely powerful. Uh, if you're able to keep presence at the front, especially, you have access into that main, and you know then the Terran has to defend on two fronts rather than the single you know, bunker defense at the uh, front here, so... That's definitely something Parton can do to make this a bit tricky as we see him taking a third Nexus back at home now, so that's on the way up. This Marine continues to uh, fire away on these rocks, so... Rocks taking quite a bit of damage. Siege Tank is on its way out, going to be heading down to the low ground in the next few moments, and again, a couple Stalkers, a Zealot, hanging out on the ramp here, so... We're going to be hanging out and still just trying to deal that little bit more damage, poking away at this bunker. So Bunker taking a few more shots. The Marine's going to get rid of the rocks. Starport building up a Banshee. Couple of Marines in production as well. as all takes a shot as it gets pushed away. And again, Gateway just sitting at the front here. So he's going to be uh, able to sit out uh, the front now. And able to warp in at the front as well if he wants to. Next to Gateway's all coming on the line. Blink's about to be done. Salad is going to be able to stay alive here, and Gumiho, of course, can push this back while holding the high ground, so that's what he will do to keep this position here, as we see the Engineering Bay coming up at the front as well. So Fraze will be able to start, so really these Cloak Banshees I'm very interested in. It's interesting, he's kind of going like Marine Tank Banshee, which is a very aggressive pushing uh, possibility, but feels like he more wants to use his harass. Really nice scout from Parting. Well, my interest in the Cloak Banshees has just decreased quite a bit, because now Parting knows about that possibility, and so should be somewhat prepared at home to defend that. An observer in each mineral line, a few stalkers around as well. And with the blink especially, you should be able to get into position to make sure that Banshee does very minimal damage here. Banshee just over halfway done. The siege tank coming up to being about halfway done as well. The next barracks on the way up in this main base too. 
Now Banshee already picking away, getting three of the probes. So job well done so far, but the shield barrier is going to finish up in good time, and that obviously helps a lot too. There is going to be the little bit of a cloak up to try and save this, but the blink on top, Banshee goes down. Well, I mean, you kind of have that observer and a few stalkers kept at home, so it gives Gumi Ho some space to breathe, but outside of that, this has been an investment that really hasn't done too much just yet. Banshee number two, heading down to the bottom right-hand side, heading towards that natural expansion. So Banshee looking to see what's going to be going on. Three more gateways, four more gateways on the way up. One-one upgrades coming into play. And just reinforcing stalkers across the map, so Parton will have those out to try and get something done. There are a few stalkers here, just needs the observer. He's missing the detection, so three more probes going down there. Oh no, the sentry's going to be in some trouble as they pop their garden shields up. So stalkers finishing warping in, the observer to the side, and there is the blink, so... Yeah, sentries are going to be good. I mean, he does force the guardian shield, which is something, but... As Gumiho just takes the third base, it does seem like this game is going to slow down a little bit. For Gumiho's favor. Oh, that's a little bit brutal, losing the stalkers at the front here so far, and not paying attention. And, well, it's going to be Gumiho able to shut down this gateway, so it takes away some of the production here. He's have a stalker as well. He might have been able to do something if these tanks weren't siege, but Gumiho siege and the tanks made this very safe. He is going to press forwards now, has the observer, so he sees the tanks on siege. Could blink into this if he's going to go for it. He has to go right away, and he is just going to walk in, pick off a tank, and then blink out. Really nice way to uh, deal with this. And oh, Blink's in. He's going to want that tank as well. So obviously blinking in, he does take more damage. But he gets three of the siege tanks now. Only one tank left up on that high ground. Now obviously a few stalkers have gone down, but nowhere near um, you know, enough to kind of say, oh, well, this was horrible. He killed three siege tanks. And a lot of the supporting damage from Gumiho's army is now non-existent any longer. And it's kind of just this Bioforce pressing across the stalkers, even trying to find a medevac there. Parting feeling good. It has to be feeling a little bit good about this at the moment. So those medivacs coming down to the bottom right hand side. Actually going to be able to cut off the stalkers a little bit. So this is a good play from Gumiho. Oh, the stalkers are absolutely trapped. He's going to have to try and recall them away or something. Bio pressing in and oh, oh he's going to blink them away to the top. Finds his ult on the watchtower too. I mean, these are so out of position now. You'd still have to recall them back home if you want to do anything useful. And the recall will come down. It's just waiting a little bit longer. Double scan from Gumiho, looking to see what's up, looking to maybe see where the army is. Army's out the front though. Zealots don't have charge, so actually the Zealots aren't that great at the moment. A little bit of a drop heads towards the uh, natural expansion, submarines so him over to the right side. Trying to hide, but Observer is in range, so he's able to see that. Gumiho mostly just trying to back away, and this drop is in some trouble too, especially because it's kind of like a siege tank, it's not going to do a lot immediately as he comes back up this way. He's going to sit in the dead air space for a while before making a decision as to how he's going to try and get out of there. Well, give me home. His uh, little push out on the map is over now. So he's going to sit back at home for a little while. It's at that stage where the party is just getting a little bit too much. He has completely forgotten charge though, by the way. He seems to have not realized this, but there is no world in which he doesn't want charge here. He does start it now. But I'm pretty sure he's not going to be able to attack until charge is done. And if he can't attack, he's kind of missing maybe the... I guess maybe the time, but in fairness, are you really going to attack up this ramp into this warlock? Charge or not, that doesn't seem like it's going to go too well for you, so... Not the end of the world for parting, but... Honestly, I was a little bit afraid for him in this fight over here when he was walking forwards with no charge. And, you know, right, you know in that moment right then, it felt like it could have been very dangerous for him. If he was able to find the fight. That's a nice blink to pick off that medevac that was just... A little bit too adventurous, still sticking around on the bottom right side. Trying to find some further damage, but not getting anything. So the zombie coming out over to the left, and we're going to be seeing the uh, bio just setting up at the front. Nexus dropping down on the low ground, and again, the High Templar just coming across. A couple more stalkers running over, too. Yeah, uh, Rocks here gonna get knocked down, so Rocks will fall. Bio still coming down. We're actually gonna see a little bit of a fight here, Gumiho. Gonna get blinked into, so the Stalker's chasing down the Marauders already. Zelt with the charge now. We'll do that much better. Parton has no intentions of going up to this high ground. He does not want to run past this Warlock. 
Cataclysm in the main phase means he can distract over there anyways and still kind of position at the front and wait for a better opportunity. His are going to be out of range of Liberation Zone, still killing off some of those SCVs. Ten workers go down, now the Wolf Prism drops the Zelds off to protect it there. He's going to recall away from the Liberator fire, obviously the Liberators don't do too much damage too quickly. But they are able to keep up with the Wolf Prism, so the Wolf Prism wouldn't have been able to just fly away. So recall will keep that alive as everything else just gathers up on the low ground. Storm is done, Storm is ready, so the first flash damage joining this army as well. And that's going to be big for part and helps them a lot when it comes to fighting this bio. But there are ghosts in play as well. Gumiho without the enhanced shockwaves upgrade, so forgetting that at the moment here is the first EMP comes down pretty good anyways. I Templar up in the War Prism, so they're protected from those EMPs until they drop out. And that's just a race of who can cast Storm Vizs, who can EMP to drop out faster. I like what part of this dude coming around from a different angle here, and actually a little bit of bio just split up. Gets jumped on pretty easily, a medevac goes down, another Zealot warping in the main base, the warpers has made its way back over here. They will do some more damage there, now actually continue to commit to this fight, the storms are pretty good, and Stalker's doing well, especially against those Liberators, doing a good job of cleaning up here. Gonna lift up, this time he doesn't have a recall to get the warpers away, but might be able to drop those Zealots on this low ground anyways. Parton not quite paying attention, well, fine. He's still losing quite a bit in these fights, his up and attack upgrade. About to be an armor upgrade up as well, so that's going to be pretty critical here. Gumiho is going to be more reliant on the Raiders and tanks maybe before dealing the damage. I say tanks, but he only has a couple tanks left. He gave up with tank production a while ago when he started going more kind of heavily in towards Liberator play. I'm just going to see Pawn pulling away, Stalker taking some damage. Fusion Core on the way up from Gumiho behind the back of the main base and just going to be seeing Pawing. Relocating around to the left and the blink forwards and two siege tanks going to get picked off. This army continue to run out over to the left hand side and again units pressing down the bottom. A couple of immortals and zealots firing away on this planetary fortress. The planetary taking quite a bit of damage there. The bio units are able to keep pushing this back. Stalkers will recall. On the other side, actually, the two Colossus that just popped out have just been killed off instantly. So Gumiho, I mean, absolutely, you know, needs is, needed to be recalled into here for Parton to be able to fight this at all. But Parton's supply keeps on dropping. Two very good storms, though, going to soften this army up massively. The last couple of storms dropping down. We still have the Liberators, but they're currently facing the wrong way. They need to try and siege up this ramp. There's not many Stalkers in play, but there is currently enough. Another Colossus just walks to its death, and Parton really doesn't have much at all. Looks like Gumiho... Might be about to pick up the first games here for Cystorm Gaming in Season 2. The Bio picking off the Nexus. Medivacs continue to get blinked onto. They'll continue to fall. So Gumiho cleaned up. And Gumiho will come out only on 131 supply. Will have killed the Nexus though. Kills 14 probes in the process. So Gumiho's economy is much better following this attack. And obviously from that economy should be able to build up a little bit more. And do very well from there. Zart Stalkers coming out around to the left. We're going to see the sentry coming over as well. Temple Archives dropping down in the main base, and yeah, I'm just going to see the Zart Stalkers splitting up a little bit. Gumiho just needs the support of those Liberators. That's all he's really missing from this, especially because he's only on 2 2 upgrades against 3 3. The Liberator support really helps with that, and so, you know, straight up Bio versus uh, Gateway doesn't go so well at the minute, but again, 3 3 is on the way and it's going to be done shortly. That opens up Gumiho's chances to fight and uh, makes them just a little bit better here. And Scan gets the Observer as well. Zapartan going to be denied vision as he pulls back away over to the left. And Zalat peeling off over to the left hand side as well. Three more Ghosts, three more Liberators on the way out. is going to go to the main part of this army. That's kind of the problem, right? Because what's been so good with this army so far has been the Zelds have been very difficult to uh, kill because it's been very Marauder-focused in the army. 
And while, you know, Marines do a lot of the damage out, but Marauders are very good at being tanky and sniping down, you know, Colossus, etc. So when it comes to a Stalker vs. Colossus fight, this army does very well, because you're kind of just missing Marines. And there's still a need for Marines in that army, though. While the Marauders are tanky, they last longer. They just do not put out the same amount of DPS, and you need that DPS, otherwise the Zealots are just going to get out of hand, so... That is good for, uh... That is good for, uh... Gumiho to start fixing. Parton going up to a fifth base over on the right side as Gumiho floats his natural command center down to the fifth as well. So similar intentions from both players. Dark Temple is starting to come into play and I'm just going to take up a few scans here and there as Stalkers. Going after Liberates. It's not as cheap as you think though. I mean, a couple of Stalkers went down. Still an okay trade for Parton, of course, as a mule and a scan drop down at the same time. And boom, we're going to see the end of that DT. Well, as Parton backs away, he goes into two Stargates, so he's absolutely starting to respect the Liberator count a little bit more here. But at that point where Liberator range is in play as well, you just can't keep fighting with Stalkers against that many Liberators. It just doesn't work out, so the Stargates absolutely to intend to go in towards a Fleet Beacon, to go in towards a uh, set of Tempests, and Tempests will be very good. Five Tempests to one-shot a Liberator. That's what you're going to be aiming for here. We're going to be seeing another couple of Storms dropping down Zealots. I want to charge into this against the Liberators that just aren't quite set up on top of the army just yet. They will get some shots off as this army makes the retreat happen. Liberators continue to send themselves forward. We're going to see a couple of Liberators that are very far forward go down. But again, I mean, multiple Stalkers dropping the High Templar goes down as well. Just wanted a bit too far forward that these Libs keep pressing in. They're very low HP, they show no fear at all. Gummy Hill reinforcement for Liberators at a time, so it's absolutely reliant on this Liberator account to make something work for him here. Oh, and kind of hides away on the bottom right hand side for the beacon starts from pawing. That's very slow because the Stargates have been finished for a little while now, and especially when you're struggling to deal with the. Um, when you're struggling to deal with this, it kind of gets a little bit tough, right? And you're going to see the Stalkers looking forward to the bio. Going after those Zelds, a couple more Storms dropping down. Zelds so taking quite a lot of damage. We're going to be uh, seeing the Liberator still actually just uncontestable. Uh, a little bit of a run by on the right side. Just going to see a Zeld warp in to shut it down. So Parton deals with that pretty well. I mean, Gumiho is at the point where he's coming up to maxing out. While Parton still sits at like 130 supply. The difference between the two there is pretty crazy. Given he was just being killing it at the minute. As this bio army comes over to the right, the Liberator is setting up as well. Archon's going to start morphing in, Zealots, Colossus, Stalkers. All coming over this right hand side, a lot of Liberators going to set up as well. Going to see Archon is just lifted up into safety there for a moment. Here we go, bio going to start pressing through this. Storm on the back, I mean the Liberators again are going to be the biggest problem of all. You see the few Marauders able to jump on towards the Colossus here. And this is the nice thing, as the Liberators start to win out the fight, you can just back away as the turn and let the Liberators continue fighting, and just sit back and kind of hit the Nexus from kind of being out of range mostly. The Liberators are going to unseage and pull away for reinforcements though. Wants to play it safe, a reinforcement round of Stalkers obviously makes it difficult to commit into that position uh, as Gumiho and to really just kind of sit there. Gumiho is now finally starting to make some Vikings, he's getting the feel that Okay, you know, it's kind of that time where you should have some Liberators up. Uh, some Tempest up to be able to deal with these Liberators. Because the Tempest, again, are absolutely the only real successful way to deal with Liberators in this kind of number. Unless you take some very good fights. Which I'd feel would be more kind of Gumiho messing up than anything else. As after 20 minutes, Gumiho has played a very tactical TVP. Pylon is going to go down. Assimilator drops as well. His fifth base not allowed to be taken in the end. As Gumiho will take a forward expansion. Parton is on his way over. He sees that expansion. Problem is, if he moves over to defend that, he's going to lose this base over here. The 2 eye Templar didn't have an engine to storm right away. The uh, Liberators were already sieging up. Reinforcements for Gumiho, by the way, in very good numbers, but on the wrong side of the map still. So, Dan needs to bring these across, and honestly, again, I don't really feel much hope for Parton's army, unless he gets some really miraculous storms off here. Marine and Marauder shut down on that topside watchtower. Liberators. 
team. They come down to the bottom and main army again, it's just in medevac. So I have to be a little careful not to fly over any blink stalkers or so, but if he reinforces with everything in the same place, this is going to be so scary to fight. A few more ghosts being brought into play. There you go. A couple of rares kind of fighting way ahead of that time. Storms are good on the bio. There's a lot of bio in the medevacs as well. It's just now starting to drop out. These two medevacs are full on the bottom side as well. And that's the biggest problem at the moment is just actually that the army from Gumiho wasn't actually out and ready to fight. As he loses these liberators, he is going to have his tech essentially reset in a way. I mean, we're at the point now where he's got a liberator and two Vikings, a couple of ghosts pressing forwards as well. Okay, a few more Vikings should up. Good EMPs to start this off, and the bio's just going to run on top of this. He's just not afraid of this. I mean, when there's no zealots in play, you can just run forward. Go into this. So, game two. In the bottom right hand side, our blue Protoss player. Up. Down. 1 0. Got there in the end. It is parting. Top left hand side, our right Terran from Psy Storm Gaming is Gumiho. We were able to take that first game and uh, look pretty good in that regard. We're going to be seeing this gateway finishing up in a moment or two. So we're probably going to come scouting across to the upper left side of the map. Da, da, da. Probably the SUV going up against each other then and... Uh, that's going to be seeing the Reaper about halfway done here from Gumiho as well. Command Center is going to drop down on that natural expansion. Nexus coming up too. Reaper is going to pop out this time around. So we didn't see a Reaper last game, but Reaper won't do much here. Full wall off by part and absolutely denies that scouting information, so... Gumiho's not going to be able to pick up much info. He's going to be completely blind. This pylon block as well in the main base means there's no access into the main and natural. So yeah, this Reaper really is in a little bit of trouble. Adept coming out, chasing that Reaper down. Adept is moving up into the middle. Reaper fires a shot off onto the Adept, pulls back down to the bottom. Yep, continuing up there as the Twilight Council dropping into the main base. About halfway done. So Twilight Council about halfway done at the moment. Nexus finishes up on the natural and just going to be seeing a couple of Marines and a Reaper. And we're going to pop around there. The Adept taking some hits. And the Adept is going to go shading up in towards the main SCV. Gets taken down and just going to be seeing other SCVs in this main base. We'll take a few hits as well, so Parton is in and Parton is starting to deal some damage as Gumiho. Well, he still has that Adept to work with over there. There's another one on this natural expansion as well now though. I mean, Hellion comes out and finally the Adept in the main is taken down. The Adept on the natural is already shading backwards though. And the tech choice is going to be a fast dark shrine. So Parton is really looking to catch Gumiho a bit off guard here more than anything else. Seeing the Hellion and the Reaper continuing down to the bottom side, Adept from Pine up on the left is going to start wandering forwards in towards the natural, so looking for some damage. Two more barracks dropping down. I mean, again, there's Adept just keeping track of what's going on. The thing is, when Gumiho gets slowed down on the economy on this low ground, loses SCVs, it's a mental thing where you become more like, oh my god, I need to drop my mule. Like, I need to get that mine. You know, what's the chance he's going for the Dark Shrine? You know, I can get away with just dropping the mule. And that's going to be the problem if Gumiho does that. On the other hand, actually, it, you know, partner has been on so much pressure here, Gumiho can't drop the mule on the natural. Doesn't really want to drop the mule on the main too often because then it mines out that much faster. It's going to be 
seen the uh, Hellion the Reaper. Hellion is going to get away. The Adept Shade's back in, by the way. Two DTs now warping in. Are we saving scans? He just dropped another mule, so... Answer that is not uh Although he does have a scan now on the natural expansion, so... Kind of depends anyways, though. I mean, we're going to be talking about two DTs, right? So... Depends where the DTs go. One could go straight up into the main, for example. Oh my god, he just dropped the next mule! Give me who's in trouble. He is going to raise the depot there, but... Yeah, this is a huge problem as Marines already start going down. Now, there is a Cloak Banshee setup coming in. Does Parton have an Observer yet? No. So, the Cloak Banshees could get a lot done as well. Does he have shield batteries? No. So, while well, Gumiho is actually starting to repair this depot and it is going to keep it alive. TTs are going to be held to the, um, you know, natural expansion where actually the SCVs can survive as well. Scan doesn't actually, ooh, doesn't actually get that, but he's going to uh, morph the Archon and recall. Here comes the Cloak Banshee, and again, there is no detection available, so the Banshee's just going to run in, and he's going to start picking up kills, and Parton's going to have to pull away, he's going to immediately start an Observer. Cloak comes in there. I mean, honestly, maybe could have got the Archon if he wanted it, but I think economic damage is more important right now, because of the fact that, I mean, he obviously just took a lot of damage himself early. His first Banshee, getting a lot of kills, he needs to get some target fire, though. A couple more probes starting to go down, now moving into the main base, where some more probes will go down. Ten, eleven 11 probes dropped so far. Banshee into the natural now is going to get some damage done as well as the Observer is in the main. This Banshee is going to pull the Observer a bit further away from the natural to maximize the damage Banshee number two will do. And with 15 workers killed, the Cloak units are dealing damage on both sides of the map because in the end here, Parting did break into the main and he actually very nearly lost the Warp Prism. The DT is there breaking down the uh, wall off. Gimno is not mining off his natural, is not building workers, so... In a way, it's still Parton's economic advantage for a few more moments here. You know, he needs to kind of stabilize a little bit. Has a missile turret in his main mineral line. Oh, he has the Raven now as well, even getting that DT on the low ground. That helps a lot as now the Warp Prism might look to make its move back into the main. So Warp Prism coming all the way around this top side. Gonna see uh, combat shields on the way up. Charges. Building on the Twilight Council. Marines, Raven still gathered up together. Stalkers and the Archon. Pressing across towards the natural here in the next few moments. There's a couple of Stalkers from Parting just going to be coming across and again ready to press in to that natural expansion. So, that's going to deal some damage, but Gumiho has the army supply. The only real scary thing of this is the Archon. He walks right into it. I mean, that move command forwards there really hurts. Oh, the Archon's very nearly down. The problem is we're now talking about Marines against Stalkers, and obviously the micro ability is absolutely on the Stalkers there. We've got a Warp Prism in the main that's still being very frustrating to deal with. Force Field on the ramp going to stop all Marines coming down, and Parton's attack is going to win the game. Gumiho kind of had... I, I mean, I didn't really like that attack from Parton, but it worked out. If Gumiho was sieged, if he didn't walk into the Archon right away... It's a much more difficult break for Tied up one to one in this best of seven. Haven't seen a lot from this man in the bottom right hand side of the map in the blue Zerg True from Sidestorm Gaming. I feel like it's been a very long time since I saw True playing some StarCraft, so uh, excited to see what he's going to bring out as to the top left. Our Red Terran player is Fantasy. What's up, Lambert's email for the three month subscription. Thank you so much for resubscribing and coming back once again. Much appreciated, dude. If you guys are enjoying the stream, don't forget we will be doing a replay pack in the near future featuring all of the replays from the recent times on the stream. Uh, it goes out to subscribers or users on the Patreon page, so you can join us on Patreon as well if you would like, exclamation mark Patreon, to check it out over there. And, uh, yeah, just, uh, lots of, uh, lots of StarCraft coming up, so if you're enjoying the stream, if you've got a Twitch Prime sub sitting around that you've not used up, do consider using it, it would help us out a whole bunch. It would go a long, long way to uh, allow us to keep on um, putting out some more StarCraft 2 content for you guys. So, if you want to subscribe, support, get replay packs and more, check it out. Otherwise, let's uh, focus up on this game. We are getting into it. And as we get this ready to roll, Ephemer uh, Ephemeron is going to be our map for Fantasy True Game. Number one between them, game three of this series, of course. We'll come out about halfway done as we do see the hatch gas and pool getting set to roll.
Yeah, just a little bit of setup here. TVZ on Ephemeron obviously definitely can go late. It's uh It's a very it's a very large map and it can definitely split map when you get to these kind of central positions. Now true, I'm not sure how well he's gonna deal it in the game, but true usually really excels off playing like a massive Ling Bane. True is very well known for playing very counter-attack heavy styles. Um, and really just trying to win off of kind of, you know, very aggressive play. Whereas Fantasy has been pretty solid lately, so I've been really excited to kind of watch him play out and to, you know, do pretty well and stuff like that. Did you see the third CC already on the way down? Fantasy playing a straight up, let's go to the macro game setup here. No second gas until just now, so that's a super fast 3 CC. He'll get a few Hellions out, of course, to kind of hold off the Ling Floods and any kind of Ling play early on. Apply a little bit of pressure, but he won't have too much. And we continue to set this up. We've got Melty in the chat cheering on True. We've got Improvement cheering on Fantasy. Let us know who you're cheering on, if it's a player, whether it's a team. What's up, Mustard Hat? Twitch Prime sub. A hat made of mustard. You ever need more mustard on your hot dog? Boom, just dip it in your hat. Mustard sorted. Boom. Amazing. Thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. Do appreciate it. Thank you for the support. Set this up. Couple more Halloween's just gathering up on that uh, ramp there for the moment. Rotoron dropping down about halfway done. Stimpak coming out as well. And again, just going to be seeing another barracks dropping down. Another couple of barracks dropping down in the main base. As the Viking here is going to be able to go and shut down this overworld in the next few moments. So, Blood will fall. Reaper from Fantasy pulling back up to the top left hand side. Again, going to be on three racks in total, so. I mean, it's exactly kind of as we expect. He went for the four Hellions very quickly into Rax. The next step of this will be Engineering Base to start 1 1 upgrades. True goes into a lair. Um, you know, Rotoran being done for a little while, building a few roaches, but yeah, going into a lair as well. He's not looking to be like hyper aggressive or anything. You see a Crypt Tumor going to be going down there. A couple of Crypt Tumors getting picked off, so yeah, some decent damage. Uh, being done for the moment as those Hellions just gathering up. I'm just going to be seeing the Zergling of True hanging out at the moment as well, so. Playing hanging out a little bit. Hellions are going to be able to come in and pick that off. And again, the two engineering base finishing up in a moment or so. Stimpak will allow Fantasy to get onto the map with the first two medivacs pretty quick as well, so. Obviously, we have only four Hellions. Your aggression at the front has been minimal, although I actually did pick up a couple creep tumors already. But uh, it means that the creep should be kind of going forwards nice and quickly, and that's why it's quite nice to get those marines and medivacs on the map ASAP. The sooner they're on the map, the sooner you can start cleaning up some of that creep spread and making future attacks that much more, you know, have that much more potential in them, basically. So the Viking running up and down the right hand side. We're going to be seeing the plus one melee attack on the Evo chamber. More Hellions and the Reaper down to the bottom. Just poking around and true, not wasting any time going to a fourth base now. Fantasy will see that. So now he's actually got a bit of a choice on his medevac drop. Does he drop the fourth base, which is obviously kind of exposed, no creep on it, or does he go for that creep spread cleaning? Mm, it's a tough call. He's actually not going to drop, by the way. He's actually going to walk down. So it looks like he wants to go for a full on push onto the fourth base. Ten more Zerglings on the way out. Extra bags on the way down. Spire will drop in from True Abandon Nest as well. And this Bio Force from Fantasy down the left into the bottom side. Thanks for the Siege. And True isn't really prepared to fight too many Marines just yet because he doesn't have any Banelings. It's only Zerglings. True is going to finish a lot faster here from Fantasy as well. If Fantasy could take a fight, it'd be good for him, but. I think Fantasy is very happy just to clean out this fourth base and start pulling away, so... I'd love now to see the Medivacs just lift up the Marines, though, and just go and, you know, start dropping this group spread, because, again, it's going to give True a lot of map control, and especially on a larger map like Ephemeron, 
if Drew has that map control, he's going to be able to play greedy. He's going to be able to play, you know, greedy while feeling very safe, and that's oftentimes the problem. Drew going to double expand one to the right, one to the left. So retaking what was just lost, and also, I mean, this base here is very difficult to hold because, I mean, we talked about there being no creep in the bottom left. It's going to be even longer until there's creep in the top right, so. You know, the drops just lining up over there. Tank's actually going to siege up in the center as Marines will snake their way through tanks and Hellbats morphing alike. This is going to be a decent amount of creeps breaking down in the center because True is just out of position. Off over to the left hand side, these Marines will get their space as well. True will cancel that in time though. Slipping still gathering up together over on the left hand side of this and again plus two melee on the way out, plus two carapace starting as well. Continue to get a lot of damage done as we do see the Zerglings going to go running in there. The Marines going to pull back a little bit. More Lings going down. Now, this isn't uh, working well for True at all. I mean, the more of these Lings he loses, especially when you try to play like, you know, very kind of Ling heavy style, it's actually going to add in some Mutalus to his play. So it's going to kind of get itself into a bit more. It's kind of standardizing itself right in towards the uh, Ling Bay Muta. Yeah, that's not very kind of typical of True. Usually True will play kind of mass Ling Bay, not much tech at all. You know, Roach styles. Coming down the bottom, we're going to see Yulings pressing in, Bailings as well, trying to see what's up. Couple of powers dropping down. One victim is dropping as well. There's Bains and Ravages over on the right. We do see the Medivac's going to drop down, picking away through some of these drones. I mean, Fantasy Rally has been good on the active on the map, obviously. Again, it's hard to provide a kill and blow here when the map is so large, so... That's why Fantasy is already just setting up into fourth place and continue to do, like, a lot of build-up here at the moment. And pressing forward, Boone's taking some damage, pulling back. I mean, these little uh, bridges are very good for the Terran if they have the tanks in position, obviously, because the Zerg will choke up running in towards them. A couple of Zerglings going down, a couple more Banelands. We can still fire in a way as the two liberators go down the right. There's Lings and Banes through at the center again on the bottom left. We see Marines doing some more damage to those couple of Queens. Liberator's going to siege, so again, Fantasy the one really initiating a lot of the damage here. Really the one able to provide a lot of the kind of opportunities so far. He starts to do three upgrades as well. That's something True will fall behind on because of the fact he hasn't got the Hive yet, although he is on the way there. We'll see what True prioritizes when Hive Tech kicks in as well. Is he going to go, you know, he has gone, you know, melee upgrades, so he does have, you know, Ultras absolutely as an option to help him transition towards Broodlords. Um, he has the Spire already, so he could drop the Greatest Fire too. Vipers might be a very good way of just going to kind of help hold off the tank play. And these bridges are really being abused by Fantasy here, just sitting there. I say abused, but just kind of used to, you know, his own advantage. Not really abusing them, they are absolutely part of the map as we see the Banes. Rolling forwards as well, Bio continue to pull back a little bit further, a couple more Banes going off and Fantasy is going to get cleaned up here as True will be able to close this army down. Fantasy had a lot of reinforcements that were still just coming across the map. Coming back over to the, through the center. Things, Mutalisks continue to run over to the right hand side and well that's going to be what Fantasy's focused on now. He did kill this base, right? So that was kind of the goal of that push in the first place. And you know, he's not going to let this, I love this as well, like True knows he wants to open this pathway because then he can surround this army more easily if he tries to use the bridges again. Fantasy's like, no, buddy, that's not happening. Now True is going to dart up for the counter attack while Fantasy is focusing on pushing. I mean, he's going to get this base on the left perhaps, he's going to get the base on the right absolutely. This on the left, maybe if you had some target fire. I mean, here's the problem now, right? Mutalists are flying in, Lings and Banes are running forwards, and Fantasy's fourth base is in a lot of trouble. Obviously, he is still dealing some pretty decent damage. These few Marines dropping off, going after the Queen and the drones. And CV is dropping. True hasn't really taken any worker damage, so that is a positive for him. Now he is starting to lose a few drones. He's dropping for the natural, cleaned up by Banelings so far. 
Fantasy has a lot of army left over though. That's the problem for trees. He's got a lot of army in this attack, and now he is starting to lose drones. These marines not dealt with in that third base, and that should have been a priority there from True. It should have been so easy for him to clean that up, but doesn't happen. Now this uh, fourth base, which has just been rebuilt, goes down again, and True is down 60 supply. Fantasy is just able to keep the economy going a little bit better for himself, able to keep re reproducing that a little bit more easily. He will do very well with this. As we are going to be seeing this bio force going back up the left hand side. Over on the right, the mutant list from True running around a bit as well. Go after a few of those SCVs, two, three going down, the wing's gonna stem in, we just fly off our way through the top. Well, Fantasy is obviously re-expanded, so it's still looking good. True is struggling when it comes to the army supply at the moment. Two two upgrades are gonna flee through as well for a few more seconds. At least that is about to be kind of done with. Fantasy losing a lot of SCVs to these middle mind. A lot of damage being done here. SCV after SCV just dropping dead. Tree drops down. Can we see the bio running around the right? Stimulus is chasing after a couple more SEVs. Bio is still chasing up the left. A little bit of moving around here at the moment as we see 29 SEVs have gone down. 10 drones. I mean, True is only on three bases, so that's kind of the bigger problem for True, right? The fact he's only on three bases, he is running out of places to mine from. So while he does have a few more workers, Eight of those workers are just oversaturated on the third. So it's a little bit tough. Drop into the back of the natural and fantasy is going to be doing very well there in that choke point. Obviously he makes the trade pretty decent for him. It's around the top, even more drones going down the main. The drop defense just has not been there from True. I mean, fantasy was showing us drops from very early in this game. And True has just done absolutely nothing about it, so... It's been pretty rough for him, honestly, as we're going to be seeing the mutas coming back around the right hand side. Marines passing forward, so Vlog will fall. Yeah, that's Bio coming around the right as we do see the Lings, Banes, and Ravages from True moving into the center of the map here. Again, the Bio over to the left. Seen more Zerglings on the way out. Well, Fantasy is obviously just sitting back a little bit, doesn't want to overcommit in or anything. True's Hive Tech only ever used for upgrades. This is a little bit messy, gonna see the bio. It's in two different sides, by the way, it's not just this army on the left. Thor's should do pretty well here against the Mutalist, though, and the Mutalist kind of died very quickly now. Thor's left up, they're gonna be brought over to safety as now. You see True having to push through those ramps once again, those choke points to get to the army. Fantasy's army movement here has been really stellar. Even the Marauders in the front, they're just picking off Banelings as they try to run away. Grabbing another Zerglin as well. I mean, this could be a scan clean of some of the creep. True's actually going to turn to fight this. Well, the Marauders are in a little bit of trouble up top. Perhaps there's a few Siege Shanks starting to support though. And again, True is just bleeding out when it comes to the numbers right now. over the left hand side, he's going to fly in as well. I mean, True's looking to just try and take these fights, but it's so difficult because Fantasy is not just in constantly good positions, he just has more units straight up as well, so it's very hard for True to make these fights work, and now he's fighting off Creep. You know, Bailings aren't even really connected until way too late, too many of them being picked off beforehand, and as True has a few Ravages left over again, I mean, he's maybe going to force Fantasy back to reinforcements, but... Now, his own reinforcements aren't going to put anything on this because there's no Balins in those reinforcements. And you absolutely need the Balins to be able to work through that Marine counters. Pushing forward, a couple more lanes, there goes the Ravages and Fantasy grabs this game. Takes it to a pick one into the lead for the first time today. In their opening match of Season 2, they made the playoffs last season. Had a very poor playoff performance though, just got absolutely destroyed by Sola in the semi-finals.
The team manager said he wasn't happy, he wasn't impressed. Feels like Parton wasn't taking the league seriously. There were rumors that Parton was maybe going to be removed from the team and replaced. Obviously didn't happen. So, uh, yeah, player Pixel 1 really have some, uh, some work to do to make sure they don't get in trouble again. I mean, they've got a lot to live up to. Obviously, playoffs last season, they'd love to go there again and really show us what they can do this time rather than just getting absolutely crushed. Fantasy is our Red Terran player in the bottom right-hand side. And in the top left, our Blue Zerg is true. Will they ever do all kill format? No, I don't think so. The whole point of the league, it's designed about being able to showcase Chinese players and give Chinese players a consistent form or consistent way to play against top Koreans. So, all kill format doesn't really make sense because you are very likely to not see any of the Chinese players play. You could only see four maps. This format's designed very well to give you at least six maps per series. It means you're guaranteed to give the Chinese players on each team a chance to play two maps. You will absolutely see them play as well. The playoffs last season were a form of all kill, and I'm not sure what the playoff format is this season. There might be some all kill there, but for the regular season, I would imagine they're not going to switch it up at all. Honestly, I really like this format. It feels a lot better than uh, some of the others. So, yeah. A couple of Queenslings and drones continuing to come out at the moment. Lance in a dropping down on the natural expansion. Going to be seeing the Overlord of True continuing to wander over to the right hand side. Factory on the way up from Fantasy. So, again, that going in the main base as we do see the Reaper continuing up and towards the main. Overlord is taking some shots. Again, that SCP just heading down, back home to the bottom right. Queen, Link Speed on the way out. Factory is going to be completing in the next few moments and just going to be seeing the SCV pulling all the way back down to the bottom right side. Hey, I'm really interested to see what True comes out with. I mean, in the end, he kind of let that game go into the later stages, which is fine. It's just like I said. I mean, obviously he kind of got put behind early, I guess, and from there he kind of struggled to maybe get as many counterattacks going as he'd like to. Fantasy was weak, you know, when we saw the, uh, you know, you know, units running around. Um, you know, we never really got to see him, you know, get to the point, you know, true where he was able to really throw lings and banes and all the bases, etc. Because he couldn't get across the map in a lot of ways, you know, again, like I said, when the mutants were running around, Fantasy had some trouble. He lost a lot of SCVs. And I imagine that's maybe what True wants to try and do again. A bit of that kind of counter-attack running around uh, action. Starport building a tech lab here in the main base. We're going to be seeing those two Marines picking away at the Overlord from True here on the natural. Reaper. Aliens running around here, Rotron on the way up from True. We are going to be seeing the Battlecruiser play from Fantasy. Now, it makes sense he might even want to go into Mech here on this map, rather than playing Bio on, again, a map that is very difficult to push on, very difficult to engage on. He doesn't have the bridges and the ledges like he did on the last map. So while the last map is large and can maybe be difficult to kind of rally push and rally fight, the ledges do make up for that a little bit. Well, the, I say the ledges, the narrow choke points, the bridges. Now, in this map, we've seen some players have success with Bio when they play a tank-heavy style and they use the ledges in the center to push down in towards this base here and so on and so forth, but we haven't really seen... Generally, Mech has been the go-to, and as two more gas to get taken on the natural, Armory starts up. Absolutely looks to be some Mech play this time around. Things starting to drop here as we're going to be seeing the roaches from True moving across. I mean, this can threaten Fantasy a little bit into maybe saying, Oh, do I need to keep my battle cruiser at home? But uh, I mean, it's not that many roaches. Obviously, True is absolutely just trying to buy himself some time to deal with the uh, battle cruiser at home. You see, he's about to pop, so we'll see Fantasy's decision in a moment. I mean, it's four roaches left. There's going to be a bunker. 
The BC is going to fly in to help turn this around, but then it's just going to teleport pretty quickly, I think. So yeah, Roach is going to get chased away. The problem is the Roaches keep running the battle cruiser won't catch up, right? So by not teleporting across the map, you're just missing out on damage to be done. He will chase those Roaches. I mean, if they're going to keep on running, then the Hellions will get damage for free. And he's going to be able to pick this off. At this point, the BC might just kind of fly across the map and keep its teleport to teleport home when it gets low. And that way it can... Okay, no, it's not. I was going to say that way it might be able to get the Yamato off as well. You see how it does here as it teleports into the third base. First queen has to be transfused pretty much right away. The queen's coming down the left-hand side. Hellions gathering up over on the left as well, so getting ready to go. They're about to finish. 22 more Zerglings coming out. Evil Chamber's on the third base. Two more factories into the main. And again, just seeing the battle cruiser here picking up even more of the creep tumors. Oh, we're taking a bunch more shots as those queens going to chase the BC away to the right side. A few more creep tumors dropping down then. As you see the BC able to pick away at a couple of those lings. Oh, yes, there's Hellbats here running in the left. I mean, there's not actually many roaches. The second BC comes in. BC is obviously going to be able to kind of focus the Queens a little bit here while the Queens are trying to push the uh, Hellbats back. Now two BCs are here together with the Yamatokans as well, obviously. The Queens are starting to drop like flies. The damage on the Queens is pretty high. Targets the Queen with a lot of energy on it. Flies to the top side where some of the Queens are not in position. And these BCs are doing a lot. Yes, the Hellbats are now cleaned up, but the BCs still have health left on them and moving into the main. They find themselves an Overlord there. Drone's already pulling away. I like this play from Fantasy. I feel like this did a lot. I like the movement of the battle cruisers. I feel like they went the right sort of directions to really maximize their damage output. Feels like it's been a really few, you know, successful few moments here from Fantasy, so he should be pretty happy with that as we see Roaches now continuing on down to the bottom right. Let's see where they can end up going. The Valkyrie's teleports in overhead, Roaches. Continue to take quite a lot of damage. He's teleporting back home to help out with this as their cooldowns come up. So the counter attack is doing pretty well, actually. 12 SCVs down. I guess because a lot of the Hellbats obviously were used up in that fight across the map, you kind of lost a lot of the defense that would usually be here, so Fantasy's doors were kind of open to get some, you know, some damage to be dealt, and now he goes from 70 to 55 workers, so it brings True back to a worker lead, which was otherwise going to be even, so works out quite nicely as you see Corruptors on the way out, so the counter to the Battle Cruisers now being established. So let's begin to be set up here as we're going to be seeing Corruptors continuing to gather together as well. And well, Fantasy just going into the Magfield Accelerator is going into quite a few tanks as well, though. If realizing that True is playing quite a lot of aggressive Roaches, we're going to get a few tanks up to help defend the back line as well. You know, rather than going in towards like Hellion Cycle and try and tank and you know play around in kite units, just changing up his composition a little bit based on what he's seeing. Gonna see those battle cruisers continuing up to the top side. There's gonna be four of them now in play. It's obviously a very dangerous number where the corruptors are absolutely gonna have a huge role to play here. Cyclones would be great as well if they could lock onto those corruptors and pick away at those. Go a long way. This BC fires off a Yamato, turns around. The BC's over here, Yamato in as well. It'll take quite a bit of damage as he runs off from this. No target fire on the corruptors, so unfortunately is. Uh, just about going to get one in the end, but all of them teleporting home. This is sometimes where the Corruptors can make that up, you know, make that move and make that opportunity to move across the map and to jump on some of the uh, BCs that have teleported now that the teleport's going to be on cooldown. 13 more Roaches, Lings, Queens, uh, Lings and Corruptors still on the way up as well. Lings and Cyclones out in the center, fourth command center. Finishing up now too. More Ravagers on the way up. Gonna start moving down the bottom right again. Hellions and Cyclones in the center. Gonna start picking away at these Zerglings. 
Blazing's actually in a little bit of trouble there. Starting to get surrounded. The blue flame means they're not quite... It wasn't quite done, so they weren't quite taking away all of the lings right away. We're making a bit of an attack happen. I mean, remember, Fantasy has quite a lot of uh, siege tanks from a little bit earlier on. Rose of Bowels on that uh, command center, and the command center will fall with the help of the Corruptors to follow up. Drew is going to leave. I mean, he's just going to fall back with the Corruptors, but he loses a lot of Roach Ravager pushing forwards. Hell, run by finds 13 drones, though, so while Fantasy loses a CC, Drew loses workers. It's a bit of back and forth here as Fantasy. You can see continuing the cycle, uh, the BCs up the right hand side. So, my score, big acid dude, how you doing? Thank you so much for the 50 month resub on the Twitch Prime. A legend. 50 months. Ooh. Plus two flyer attack on the spire. Infestation pit. Dropping down as well on the main base. And again, these BCs coming around the top of Fantasy to see where they might be able to attack into. He's flying in towards the main on the bottom side. But do you see this Hellion going to get picked off as well? So, Witches will be able to kill that off there. Queen goes down in these drones. Taking quite a bit of damage as well. Spore crawler drops. Infestation bit just about halfway done. Corruptors are going to fly in. Obviously, BCs do have teleports to get out of here with. So, they just line up your Mardos and get some more damage done before they head back home. Fantasy just about to have this fourth base online. So, really did need this actually. Without this fourth, he's in a bit of trouble. More Hellions around the top hive on the way up. Just coming over to the left there, Hellions chased down. Nine drones killed. Fifth base here from Fantasy gonna go up the right side. It's gonna land in a moment or two, and again, as Hive continues to tick away. Fantasy is just continuing to build up battle cruisers. He's doing a very good job. Hasn't lost a battle cruiser all game. Resources lost is very fantasy favored too. Which is why True does need to try and stay on you know bases ahead of Fantasy, which he has done until around now. As Fantasy establishes this base here, they're gonna be even. So True needs to try and keep on, you know, denying that. The problem for True is I feel like his composition isn't going anywhere. You know, it feels like it's still just Roach Ravager. Yes, the corruptors are here too, but Where's the next tech to really fight this army? Yeah, the Crooks can fight the BCs, but it's getting to that point where there's more and more BCs. There are so many siege tanks here. We don't have the opportunity to morph in Broodlords. The Ravagers, I mean, now we see a few Ravagers morphing in, a few extra. I mean, it's going to be six Ravagers in total at the moment. I mean, never mind the battle cruisers. These tanks feel kind of unkillable. When you have so little Roach Ravager, I mean, they're going to start coming in already, but... Again, attacks from the high ground already doing pretty well. That's a good two corrosive bars to pick off two tanks at least. You see he's coming in now overhead as well, so they'll only help. Yeah, they'll only help the fantasy get into a better position here as we see the Halbats. Continuing to push the roaches and ravages away over to the left hand side. You see he's able to pick off the overlord there and just gonna still see the uh Tanks flying away. Some mill has been made. So actually, I mean, mules are an interesting choice because obviously, if there's not enough anti-air and you have to take a fight, you know, the BCs can't really fight against the mules. You can fight against the corruptors. He's going to come in. He does have quite a few cyclones. Teleports away there. The cyclones going to keep on running. We'll get some of the corruptor kills. It's a good push by uh, Fantasy, but again, the uh, the mules are just coming in as a bit of a surprise factor. Now the siege tanks are in trouble. If the siege tanks go down. There's nothing to defend the roaches at home, so Truce playing playing the meters is going to work for the moment. My problem is, what if some Thors come out? Now you're stuck with Mutalists, and then the ground army is going to be somewhat unstoppable again. I'm still not convinced. Roaches and Ravages continue to cross the battle. Planetary Fortress is going to fall. SCV is dropping too. Cyclones continue to lock on towards Roaches, Ravages, Corruptors as well. Over on the left, Hellion's running by, picking up another couple of drones. Zergon's going down also. Mealus will fly in as Hellions will be chased as Mutas, Corruptors, Roaches, and Ravages up on the top side. The Cyclones and PCs pulling back a little bit. Hellions re-engaging in, actually some Hellions from the left side too. Gonna get cleaned out in an instant. 
Those Mews doing a decent job of this. More Mews on the way. I'm surprised True. I'm sorry, I'm surprised Fantasy is still building Cyclones rather than just going into, I think, the more expected just build Thors, you know? Especially because the Mews are the real problem. I mean, I know obviously you can't seem to fight the Corruptors at the moment either, but if you get rid of the Mutalisks, then your ground army doesn't care about the Corruptors, and there's no great Aspire in play. Obviously, maybe Fantasy doesn't know that, but we do. Fantasy is struggling along here a little bit, it feels like, as Hellions, Cyclones, and Tanks still joining up together. Corruptors and Mutalisks up the left-hand side. 16 more Lings on the way out. Claws still ticking along here as we do have this army moving around. I mean, uh, I mean, characters are kind of out on their own now rather than with. I mean, it's actually just two different clumps. Oh my god, there's so many mutalisks. 36 mutalisks. That's actually a bit crazy. I've seen drilling claws and widow mines in production too. I mean, I'm just so surprised we don't see any Thors. I feel like the Thor is the, the straight up answer to this, right? That would have been my goat. Like, I, I would just imagine that was kind of the obvious choice, but apparently not just yet. Yeah, Willemine's little burrow here as the Cyclones can obviously pull back to those two. Kind of keep themselves safe if the Mutas decide to try and chase them down. 26 more Zerglings, 3 more Mutalists in production. Battlecruisers from Fantasy continuing down to the bottom side here. Cyclones get a few more kills. Things continue to drop. Mutas and Corruptors around the bottom side. Battle Cruiser is still down here as well. The Mardo Khan is going to line up and DCs will just teleport away instantly. We're going to see again those Widow Mines there are going to try and be baited, baiting those Mutas into them. Widow Mines going to burrow again. It just gives again the Cyclones that safety kind of barrier where the Cyclones can just run back knowing that they're going to be very safe because there's no way you can realistically chase the Zerg. I like the idea of the wooden mines, just again. I don't see why a couple of Thors isn't... When when you consider the ground army now is literally 12 Zerglings, the only problem is the Mutalists, right? The the army of True is literally... Okay, 40 Zerglings, 38 Mutalists, 40 Mutalists, and a few Corruptors. Oh my god, wooden mines! There's some really good shots off there, so the Mutalists do take a beating, but... They're not going down just yet. They will be able to fly off and regenerate. I mean, you could literally build Heli and Thor, and finally we see some Thors on the way from Fantasy. I really feel like this was the decision much longer ago, actually, that should have been made. It just hasn't come through in the end. Mio's back down the right, gonna chase after these SCVs. I mean, flying in here gets another bunch of workers, eight workers down. So the mines want to try and come underneath, but you know what? True is doing a pretty good job paying attention. Obviously, it gives itself up to. Pick up a couple of those Widow Mines, kills off a couple of workers with a friendly fire actually. Fantasy's army supply is way up though. A couple of investors on the way now from uh, True as well. Talking about six Valkyries, no Corruptors anymore by the way. Now the Mutas can definitely still fight BCs, but the Corruptors were absolutely the kind of the tanky front line that was keeping those Mutas alive in the sky. Now, I mean, you can see True knows he needs them, stock six more. Well now there's not going to be as much to stop the Battlecruisers, so to slow the Battlecruisers down. The Mews are looking to counterattack. The Cyclones here will pick off a base and continue on. The Cyclone and the Hellion just going to chase down a uh, Infestor on the ramp there. It does get the kill. Infestors are coming out with uh, no energy on them. There's no path and glands upgrade researched here, so it's obviously a bit of a shame as that's going to be another middle that's going down as well. Again, True's just being chipped away at the moment. There's an army pressing into the middle of the map. Cyclones, Battle Cruisers, all moving through the center here. There's some meters down on the bottom as well. BC is still moving across. 42 more lanes, 8 more banes. Coming out. And 3 more fours. Faster and a corruptor picked off. Still meter ling. Running around. I mean, these little counter attacks are very good because the meters don't really want to split themselves up because then the BCs can fight them. So, because there wasn't a lot on the ground, these counter attacks have found themselves doing quite a bit until now. You see in the bottom, they have to teleport back again, so you see they're very safe to go harassing around here before then being able to teleport away. Engineer Bay gonna get picked off, Mutalist gonna continue coming in. 
claws at the moment. I mean, the problem for these claws is that they're not supported, but Widow Mines are burrowing. And a lot of the lanes. The Mule's taking a bit of damage here. Fantasy has the bases on the other side of the map still. More Thor's available coming in on the right. Fantasy, as long as he keeps man in the space down here, we'll still have incoming. Oh my god, the Mutilus just got destroyed. Oh man, Thor's getting some shots off there. And meanwhile, True is just losing base after base. He's going to lose the Spire, actually, so he's not going to be able to keep building up as much as he'd like to. And well, now he's losing overworlds as well. And he's actually not close to being supply block yet, but he's just continuing to lose all of his production. So he may as well be supply block. What the hell are you going to build? I guess he can still build investors, but that's about it. The Immortals are going to line up straight onto the Corruptors. And he teleports away, but actually there was only one middle list left. But he teleports to the rest of his army, which is pressing forwards. Looking to take down another base over here. And this is looking as though it's going to be... Uh... Pretty much is. We're going to see more and more drones going down. 54, 56 workers killed. 59, 60. True is down to 7, 6 drones. I mean... We're talking about a single digit work account, half the army supply. Took Fantasy a while, but he'll get there, he'll find this victory. Five of this series. I think I start to run to break faster. Um Firefly is in the bottom right from Pixel 1. One map win will win the series for him and his team. In the top left at Red Protoss is Sakura. So get this set and ready to go. So, setting this up, getting this ready to roll. Just maybe seen a couple stalkers on the way out as this PvP has been sent a pretty regular, just a hidden pylon of here from Sakura, which he is going to use to throw down a Stargate. So, Stargate dropping in the main to get us started with this at the moment and just going to be seeing the uh, probe running out onto the map again just going to have a couple of stalkers picking their way through that pile on it will go down as the pylon gets uh, killed off here actually Skrull will cancel the next couple of units and build a nexus so yeah, just trying to mind game Firefly a little bit he will go Stargate now himself Firefly will have two more stalkers so he's really just kind of making sure he's very safe we obviously have the Stargate coming up soon, but very interested to see how that plays because obviously it depends what you build. Oh, a pants on the Stargate? He built a Twilight. Was it scouted? It was scouted. Okay, so Firefly saw it. Hmm. Okay, so Sakura's actually playing a very kind of mind game heavy game. He's gone from building a Stargate which got scouted, and because it got scouted, it's going to be re scout though. Because it got scouted, the Stargate was built from Firefly. He's re-scouting now, but to know whether he should make a Phoenix or an Oracle. The Oracle is a good choice because obviously Phoenix on greater in the long run, and it will give potential detection against what could be a DT play from Sakura. That could be why he's rushing up this Twilight Council now. Let's find out as he shield battery blocks, but Stalker's just gonna run into the main bay as well. I mean Sakura's Stalker's just not not here at all. Firefly already in the main and this uh well, this stalkers are gonna get shield batteries to help. Stalker will block here, and actually that's going to allow the probes around, so this is going to make this a bit funky. Probes are going to start going down, the two Stalkers helping out a lot. Oh my god, this actually got really crazy really quickly, I mean. Really nice play from Sakura to be able to minimize damage here, but obviously it still does hurt. Blink is going to be the choice. The Oracle shows up, the problem is the shield battery still has a lot of energy on it, so it's not worth committing into. You know what, it might have actually been worth fighting the Stalkers that were on the bottom side, rather than trying to run away. Obviously, he couldn't have known he was going to get trapped in and forced to fight anyways. But if he'd been able to kind of like run in, like if he drained the shield battery energy because of those stalkers, that oracle obviously then does so much more damage, right? And that would have been, you know, really awesome perhaps. However, obviously that doesn't happen. We do see a second oracle is coming across the map and, oh no, he's going to lose the first one. I mean, the second oracle is meant to make it so you can actually deal damage in that main base. So, uh... Losing the first one is obviously a, a real shame. Alright, well Firefly wandering in with the uh, Oracle and is going to go for the Stasis Ward. Will be able to catch a few of those probes in the Stasis. So a few probes caught in the Stasis there already as we see the Immortal. On the way up, a few a couple of Adepts on the way out from Firefly as well. Starting to run out up the right hand side of the map. 
Blink gonna finish in a few moments of time, plus one attack immortals in production. Probably counts on the way out from Firefly here as well, as we still see those couple of devs just continuing to head up to the top. Oracle is on its way to see if it can do much more. Comes in and gets the one probe on low HP, the other probe shield battery right away, and does get one more probe at least, seeing some extra gateways dropping down. Screw up building glaives. Gonna play like a glaive stalker follow up here, but it's playing down in by 12 workers. Firefly has the economy advantage here, and with a couple of adepts showing up, even more probe damage is done. Six workers killed, so now it's a 15 worker difference for a moment. Or Prism on the way up. Sakura's adding gateways to go for an all in. I mean, as Firefly goes into plus one attack and more, this is a much more standard game for Firefly. Gotta remember that Firefly's gateway units will be much worse. Obviously, you know, adepts won't have glaives, stalkers won't have blink. He is going to start charge, but his charge is going to be done in time for this attack. There's absolutely a small time window here for Sakura to maybe get some damage done. But it's really small. It's going to be when this Glaives is pretty much done. You can maybe pick off the first few Zelds very quickly and break through in towards, you know, the first Immortal or so very easily as well. Let's go see the... Uh Nexus recalled one of the adepts there, the army of Sakura setting up. Obviously a lot of gates now ready to go, but he's actually going to be a bit supply block. 55 over 62 isn't enough to make use of all seven gateways that are in play at the moment. Uh, and this seems to just go from bad to worse for Sakura. I'm waiting for those pylons to finish here. I mean, there's a few of the adepts that did walk in in the end. Two more is going to greet the stalkers, say get out of here, you don't belong. And the stalkers back away pretty quickly. A couple of stalkers here actually chasing down an observer. Just wants to try and stop any kind of high ground blink action coming in, right? There's actually two observers. This is a wall prism too, so there's a lot of potential, you know, there's a lot of high ground vision available. I like what Firefly is doing, you know, I like why he's covering with the observer though. The depth's gonna shift forwards here now. There are. Oh, there is a shield battery here as the adept jumps straight onto the first of all. The Zealots actually move back and forwards a little bit there. The stalkers will blink in as well. So let's start to get on top of this. We're gonna see the stalkers blink onto the immortals. I really don't like that because. The problem is, you know, beforehand the, Zell the Immortals were firing onto the Adepts, etc. Now the Immortals fire onto the Stalkers guaranteed. These Adepts will shade up into the main, and this is looking not terrible for Sakura. It's kind of working for the moment, although it is now just purely Adepts, and there is plus one attack in play for his opponent. He doesn't have any of those upgrades. Where is he going to go with the Adepts? It's going to cancel, stay in the main. More Adepts warp it into Firefly hurting in an army supply down 25 to 40. Depth will shade over three of them coming straight in to pick up a couple of probes. Three probes go down, make that four, five, six. I mean, now Firefly is down 11 workers, and this attack seems to have worked. So, uh, Firefly maybe should have been a bit safer, knowing how much damage he dealt. Add another shield battery, be a little bit safer right away. Absolutely needed a way to block those adepts as well. When you see these adepts in your natural, you should know. The potential of war, you know, going up and shading into the main is huge, so. You know, dropping down the pylon or so to block or being ready to do that at least would go a long way as well. I mean, Firefly starts up glaives of his own. I feel like that is absolutely not the upgrade that you need here. Sentries will force field. That doesn't affect adepts. That's actually a terrible... The sentry warping is such a weird choice too. I mean, what is that going to do? Guardian shield maybe, but force fields, adepts can shade through. The stalkers can then blink past. I'm not convinced. All right, Adept's gonna shade on up into this natural. I mean, now there's 20 army supply difference, just so many Adepts. Like I said, there was a small time window in this game for Sakura, and he's absolutely made it work out. A recall on, I don't even know, the War Prism came back home. He was trying to get across the map to deal some damage. I don't mind that idea, actually. It would probably go a long way. I'll tell you what, against this many Adepts, instead of Glaives, build a Templar Archives, get into High Templars. That would go a lot better. Stalker's gonna blink onto the War Prism, take away some of the mi uh, micro. The War Prism actually eats a lot of the shield battery energy there, and again, there's just so many Adepts. They are just going to kill everything, and Sakura is going to have the numbers to take the fifth game for Psystorm Gaming. Psystorm are going to keep themselves in this series. Two to three. Let's jump into this next series, or next, next map, I suppose. Still on match point in the top left-hand side, our red Protoss player is Firefly. And the bottom right hand side, Sakura. Coming in as our blue Protoss player. So. Okay, 
Yeah, and it's ready to roll. Gonna be seeing a gateway dropping down on either side. Expecting this to go to two gate apiece, of course, to get started at least. Just a reminder as well, we're gonna have a um we're gonna have the um Chatting Team Championship games going up on YouTube, so if you do miss a series, we are going to commit to uploading every China Team Championship series on YouTube this season. So if you want to catch any of the China Team Championships, exclamation mark, at YT in the chat, we'll give you the link to the YouTube channel, get subscribed over there. They will start going up today. Uh, we're going to do, basically, obviously it's going to be six uploads a week, so we're going to do two uploads a day for China Team Championship, moving away from our one upload a day uh, that we've been doing up until now, so... That's what's going to be going on. Just so you guys know. Probe wandering around, coming down on the bottom. Looking to see what's up as we do get this rolling. Again, probe on probe action here to get us rolling. So, just waiting to see what's going to happen here on Acropolis. Again, Firefly's map pick was Acropolis, so it's his choice again. He had such a good early game and just needed to find some sort of defense against that attack and like I said there was that little bit of a timing the units that you know Firefly was making in that time wasn't good and you know for what he was about to deal with that's why you need shield batteries etc and there was also moments where it was like you know the zealots were move command a little bit I was still questioning the stalkers blinking in for Sakura because I know they blink to try and just target down the immortals ASAP but as long as the immortals are sat there literally attacking at depths they're not doing that much damage really um, but when you blink the Stalkers in, Sakura started to lose all of the Immortals, right? Uh, sort of the Stalkers, because then the Immortals are just target firing the stalk Stalkers without any actual kind of micro input from the other side, so... That one was pretty interesting, as we are going to be seeing the Robo dropping down. This could be a straight to three gateway play. And there is third gateway drops down for Firefly, so he's just going to try and one base this to pick up the quick win. Now there is a Robo coming down from Sakura as well, so defensively is not that far behind. As it drops this Nexus. Let's see what Firefly can do. This should just be a Warp Prism and Gateway units from Firefly. Whereas Sakura is absolutely going to be looking to get an Immortal out to help the defense. So a couple of Stalkers starting to run down the right. Hallucinated Voidery from Sakura heading out into the center of the map at the moment. This nation moving over, the stalkers continue to gather at the bottom, and again, the next is going to be about halfway done. Shield battery immortal in production. I mean, it's all the correct sort of defenses that you need. Shield battery's in the mineral line, mind you, so that's not going to help too much. Mineral line in the main doesn't exactly go super far. Again, that immortal first is obviously going to help quite a bit as the stalkers here from Firefly will just get the pylon. If you can hold the low ground and potentially then. Make something happen going on from there. This is interesting because the force fields are pretty good, but he is going to turn with the stalkers. Being pretty good. A stalker for a stalker so far is not bad. Six stalkers now here. Now the warp prism is here as well, but now there's an immortal. Can he fight that immortal with the warp prism micro? A couple of force. So again, another force field. But now the sentry is out of force fields. They're not as useful as they'd like to be. A couple more stalkers warping in. The micro not perfect, honestly, but is starting to get there. Some of these stalkers are just so low, such low HP, of course. Immortal taking a lot of hits. Is going to go down if he chases for it, so the Immortal will fall. The stalkers are still just about surviving for the moment. Super low HP stalkers as they'll go on towards this Nexus. Uh, War Prism is going to finish from Sakura. He's down by, well, a bunch of army supply. Now we see some Adepts warping in as well. The Adepts are that nice tanky frontline and the ability to shade up into the main, so... Can absolutely be a threat there. Was a Corona boost in that Robo for a moment or two without committing in. Devs will not commit to this. We'll just stay on the low ground. Nexus will die. And now Firefly has to make a decision. Does he expand? Does he keep pushing? Oh, he's going to start a Twilight Council. Interesting. Sentry warps in to be able to help out there as well. Warp prison will take a shot. Sentry on that low ground is kind of looking for the force field in the corner or so, but won't find it. Obviously, this is one of the problems now with the fact that this uh, gateway is going to take some damage and Sakura's going to lose some of his production. The mortal will come out, but it doesn't look as though it's going to move forward to defend this. Not before the gateway goes down. A death will threaten to shade in once again. And that forces these units to pull away to make sure they go over there. Twilight well, Council is again about to finish up. A mortal building at home. And yeah, what do you build? I guess you go into glaives, right? Because you're already building quite a few adepts. Unless you really want to go blink. 
trust and a little decision. Stalkers can't get properly in range to make much of this over here. Nice lift up on the Immortal. Doesn't even lose the shield, the barrier. Uh, cool down. Is the barrier icon, by the way, like basically the same for the Immortal? Is the barrier icon for the Immortal basically the same as a uh, the enhanced shockwave icon? Looks pretty similar. Sakura is going to see the War Prism heading around, but obviously Firefly sees the War Prism heading across the map too. Um, there is an Immortal over here. There's soon to be two. There's going to be a shield battery in the mineral line, so that should be okay. Again, these few units just poking around, seeing what they can do. Has to be careful when the War Prism's out of position, though, of course. Sakura lost a couple of workers there. Again, Glaive's on the way up. These Immortals, okay. This is nice, just looking to fight and shut down this pylon, of course. Now you don't have War Prism Micro to help out on this side. It does pull back to the Shield Battery, and that will help quite a bit. So there's only one Shield Battery, it only has so much energy. Armies are staying similar as they stay on one base. Pylon lost over here. Firefly and Sakura both actually getting close to a supply block. Firefly will be the first to fix it, though. Robo Bay will give Sakura the option of Disruptors. Which could be big in this. Is he going to go for the sentry? He's going to snipe down the sentry at the cost of, what, a couple of adepts? He's looking to take this fight. I mean, honestly, I don't really like it. The adepts are going to shade up. Obviously, all of this is on the low ground, so the adepts can commit into the main if they want to. Now, they're going to stay and fight here because I think he knows that this fight is going very well for him. Whenever Immortal pops out, yeah, I kind of like that fight for Firefly. Now, the adepts are going to shade forwards again. This time, they probably can commit into the mineral line. Target down a few of these probes. Shield battery is going to start going crazy. Immortals still under fire from the stalkers on the back side of this. Eight probes killed so far. Make that 10, 11. Oh my god, the adepts have been left here. As they're going to pretend to shade down, there's no way you let that finish, right? Yeah, no way. There's just too much opportunity here. As Firefly is going to kill pretty much all the probes of his opponent. And this now just becomes a defense. The Walker isn't recalled home. And my god, zero probes for Sakura. He starts up one. He's got a disruptor on the way. Firefly doesn't even need this War Prism here. He just needs to go home and defend. Another Immortal on the way up. He's going to start building the Stargate. Knows about the Disruptor potential. Yeah, I mean, there's literally two probes up in the game. I mean, Depth's going to drop down, pick up the first one, going to get the other. That's it. That's actually it. There's no minerals. There's not enough minerals left if this probe goes down. Right, War Prism recall now. It, it just go home. There's absolutely no need to be here. I mean, he's going to try and kill these pylons. I mean, I guess he's not in immediate trouble, but should absolutely save the recall, because all he has to do is defend. Whoops, and another Adept on this side as well, actually. He's going to get the first pile on there and powers the gateway. This Immortal is going to come out. I mean, he's just trying to make the most of the units across the map, right? And Firefly just knows he can just sit here, and as long as he holds, he can even pull some probes to help him defend, as long as he, you know, in the end, takes it down. Gotta be very careful of the Disruptor, of course. The Disruptor shot could be huge. Sentry warping in. This pylon will go down. That will give access for the Disruptor to fire. Again, I'm not sure. Firefly still go the pylons is really necessary. I'd just love to see the War Prism at home because the War Prism at home would be amazing right now. It would do so much. It would give you the micro. You could dodge Disruptors. Phoenix is going to come in. The Phoenix is big. That's going to be a big opportunity to lift up the Disruptor, of course. Firefly holds the high ground for the moment. The Disruptor drops. Is it going to be lifted too soon? It's going to start pushing down. There's the lift on the Disruptor, so it's taken out of the fight, and that's the only thing you really had going. Sakura's going to type GG, and Firefly will close it out for Pixel 1.